Within my first few visits here, I felt com comfortable and accepted. So I quickly became a member and learned about UUCCI traditions as I went along. In many ways, I'm still learning what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist. After the service today, we'll have our annual meeting. Each year, we have a chance to participate in the growth of our congregation, as well as acknowledging where we've been and or where we've come from. It's a chance for us to take part in our living tradition, if you will. If perhaps by the off chance I disappear tomorrow, I am aware that as a friend, member, and a worship associate, there is a chance that my name will be included in the history of this congregation. It is possible that years from now, someone might say, hey, do you remember that one Valentine's Day Sunday on Zoom during COVID lockdown when Lori Swanson helped us write a congregational love poem? It doesn't matter to me if my name is remembered or not. But what I do hope from the effort I put in, the hours I've spent connecting with others and volunteering my time, what I hope comes from that effort is the continuation of UUCCI. It is my hope that others who come searching for connection, others who are new to Columbus or perhaps feel like outsiders, others who want a spiritual home and a place where they feel accepted. I hope these future, future connection seekers at least have the option of UUCCI. This place has been a gift to me and I wanna help give this gift to others. That is why I put in the effort and take part in our living history. Yeah, yeah, I'm just waiting for the Sunday service. Yeah, I'm doing the Wonder Box. Yeah, from home. Yeah, I got COVID. <clears throat> oh, wait. Oh, I think I'm on. Oh, okay. I'll call you back. Sorry about that. Um, it is that time of our service again. My favorite time where we imagine and wonder aloud together about some things. And, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about lately is that today is our annual meeting. And our annual meeting sort of pieces together another chapter of our history as a congregation. And lately, a few folks in the congregation have been helping with archiving some of our congregational archives. And I was thinking about all the writings and histories that those pieces of paper and things uh, embody, and it's a lot. It's a lot of writings and it's a lot of um, histories that you know are filled with stories from our lives and i kept thinking how are we writing the next chapter of our story and so i thought about uh, the annual report that is going to be coming out later today and and the financials and the new board and the bylaws yep the bylaws and a lot of this stuff you know can feel a lot like business business as usual. And what I hope is that when we read the history of our congregation or the minutes of this annual meeting, that we try to read beyond just the simple text on the page. We try to remember that there were people there, some of you who were there at those various chapters of history, that those histories are more than just what is on the text. There is the what lies beyond the text of our of our congregational history books. So today, as we begin to hold history as a congregation, as we begin to think about um, the future of our congregation at our annual meeting, as we reflect on the previous 54 years and hope for 50 more wonderful years, I hope that you notice what lies bet between the lines and where you fall in that history and 
those stories of our congregation. I hope that we can write wonderful stories together. And I'm really sorry that I can't be there with you today to open the wonder box and to see all of the mysteries and wonder, wonderfulness that comes through. I'm with you in spirit. I'm with you right here watching online. And I send you my love for today and for always. May we go beyond the text towards that deeper truth of the love that is present in this community between all of us now, then, and always. May it be so, and amen. As we gather this morning, let us be a people of not forgetting. Let us practice holding collective memories that might otherwise slip into that enormous void that sucks at and corrodes any future we hold dear. Let us practice honoring truth telling from the past that must come fully into the now, lest we falter and fail, lest the whole remain in pieces. Let not our need for comfort or simplicity, for easy forgiveness or false pardon, smother the heartbreak that still needs healing. Let us practice resilience with reckoning. Let us marry memory and promise. Let us dance in the tension we find there. Let us rest in the integrity we cultivate there. Let us be partners with the possibility that emerges there. It is good we gather. Our second reading is May We Be Keepers of Thy Flame by Reverend Dick Gilbert. O oh, flaming chalice, symbol of a free faith, burn with the holy oil of helpfulness and service. Spread warmth and light and hope, warm hearts grown cold with indifference, light dark places with justice, rekindle hope in despair. May we bring fuel for thy fire of love. May the oil of loving kindness flow from us to thy leaping flame. May hands of service shelter thee that no winds of hate may extinguish thy brightness. May thy light and warmth be eternal. May we be keepers of thy flame. Almost six months ago, I sat in this very chair, in this very room, in this room that has become a sort of sanctuary for me over the past year and some change. For over a year, this was my reluctant sanctuary, this desk was my unexpected pulpit. And I sat here as you sat in your homes, in your rooms, in your sanctuaries, and we met in this virtual space of shared ministry during a time of COVID. Six months ago, I made a perhaps ill-advised statement that that Sunday, May 23rd, was going to be the last Sunday preaching from this particular sanctuary as we began our journey, which has felt more like a long, slow crawl, back to holding services together in person at UUCCI. Oh, how naive I was. As we now know, the numbers of COVID infections spiked again in the late summer and fall, and what was meant to be an autumn of endings and new beginnings of beautiful new chapters starting in our shared ministry together have left us now scattered still in all directions with some of us still in our homes, some back in the sanctuary at UUCCI and me, well, here, once again in this reluctant sanctuary, pre-recording a sermon on Saturday that I dare hope is more inspiring than it felt to write. As you may have read in an email that went out this week, 
I have tested positive for COVID-19 along with my not yet three-year-old daughter, Holly. Gratefully, Hattie, who is 21 weeks pregnant, tested negative on two separate occasions, and they have spent the last several days in a hotel nearby. Additionally, I'm thankful that Holly and I, at least at the time of this recording, have shown only mild symptoms. And besides being a solo parent with a toddler, we're doing all right. I shared at our monthly Sunday services team meeting on Friday that I'm not sure whether it's sad or ironic, laughable or poetic for a minister to contract COVID after 20 months of faithfully leading a congregation through a pandemic while maintaining best practices for public health and safety. I still don't know. Oh, whether it's all of these or none of these or some of these things, I do know that I have felt so loved and cared for by the outpouring of concern you have shared these past few days for me and my family. I feel held today, even in this isolation, by this loving congregation, this community, you, each of you together, a people of hope and courage. I celebrate and am grateful for the love you have shared through text and Facebook message, through email and phone calls, and through meals that you have dropped off as Hattie and I navigate this complicated road before us. And of course, it is hard to be away from you this Saturday, this first Sunday of the month as we prepare to hold our annual meeting after the service. It is hard to be away because I cherish this Sunday each year more than you may realize. The annual meeting marks another year of ministry that this congregation has fostered in this part of Indiana, in this corner of the world. The annual meeting is not just an opportunity to do business as usual, but to remember and cast forth our gratitudes for the past and our visions for historic tomorrows. In that sense, it is hard to hold any annual meeting as a standalone gathering. In fact, perhaps it is more appropriate to call the gathering that is to follow this service, not vaguely the annual meeting, but rather the 54th annual meeting of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Columbus, Indiana. The 54th year that you have been gathering first as a lay fellowship without a building and then a fellowship with part-time ministers and a building then as a congregation and finally as a congregation with full-time ministers and staff, a beautiful building and grounds and a bright future before you. What a history you have had. Second only, I would suggest, to the future that is on the horizon. This month, we are exploring the theme of holding history, an apt time to consider the histories we are connected to and the histories we shape through our lives, that we shape through our living. Over the next few weeks, we will be looking back and looking forward, holding the histories that must be held, that must be touched, for they are not merely held by us, they also hold us as well. Our histories hold us as a congregation and as individuals. And I say, with confidence and love, on this Sunday, in which we celebrate our 54th annual meeting, we are indeed held in the hands of a living, beautiful tradition. Now, if you are unfamiliar, my sermon titled today borrows and amends its name from a historically significant piece of writing of religious writing by Jonathan Edwards. His sermon, his sermon was written in 1741 and titled, in contrast, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Aren't you glad I'm not preaching that gospel today? But in all seriousness, the implications of this sermon from 200 
and 80 years ago, almost 300 years ago, have been enormous. They have shaped a lot of the religious history that has unfolded since in this country and remains a consequential event to this day. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God is an essential text that represents the blistering conservative theology of the first great awakening in the United States. Needless to say, the imagery of the title and the message of its, context, of its contents is diametrically counter to the theology of Unitarian Universalism today. We are not sinners in the hands of an angry God. Most Unitarian Universalists don't even use the concept of sin or even have a concept of God, for that matter, in their worldview. And yet, despite the distancing we may desire from this narrow Calvinist theology, we are in a way connected to its history, its origin, and its legacy. You see, Jonathan Edwards comes from the same world of Puritanism and Congregationalism that our forebears emerged. Edwards believed, like our forebears, in the importance of character above all else, above faith, above good works. It is our character that is to be minded and acted upon. And this move toward congregational piety offered distinct visions of the future living tradition that we are now inheritors of. Jonathan Edwards made way for an evolving conservative religious worldview that defined love, God, and community in an increasingly restrictive way. This has led to innumerable harms relating to homophobia, misogyny, racism, and environmental disregard. Through the first, second, third, and some would argue now fourth great awakenings, our shared living tradition as Unitarian Universalists has been both threatened yet fortified in its alternative worldview. You see, about a hundred years earlier, another worldview was already taking shape that would resist the coming waves of conservative religiosity in the centuries that would follow. And one of the surprising proponents of this worldview was John Winthrop. No, I'm cutting deep into the recesses of our memory from our high school US history classes. But if you recall, John Winthrop uh, seems, oh, uh, and just as an aside, it seems like a lot of white people uh, white men were named John back then, such as my first cable ancestor to come to United States in 1630, John Cable. Anyway, I named, uh, I digress, John Winthrop helped to found the Massachusetts Bay Colony and later served as its second, sixth, ninth, and twelfth governor. I guess he needed to take some breaks. Well, besides helping found this colony, he is less known for a different religious writing of his day, which is titled A Model of Christian Charity. It was a lay sermon that was given around 1630. That's almost 400 years ago. And in it, he explained the importance of modeling the Puritan community around certain Christian principles of charity, kindness to your neighbor, and high moral character. By first coining and invoking the imagery of the city upon a hill, it both fostered the early and complicated myth of American exceptionalism, and at the same time, it painted a vision of community that seeks a more compassionate and interdependent sense of society that was not normative at the time. Those two strands of history are connected to the living tradition of Unitarian Universalism. And now here in 2021, at this threshold of the 54th annual meeting of our congregation, we are invited once more to be both held in love and in accountability by and to this living tradition. We are called to ask, how will we hold this and other histories. We are asked to, we are called to ask, how will we hold this and other histories while, while seeking 
to shape a more just and loving future together? How will the 55th year of our lives together as bearers of this living tradition, of this flaming chalice before us, of the memories and hopes of those who came before, how will this year before us be characterized? I hope and believe our living tradition calls us to side with love, to answer the call of love in this year ahead, knowing that these parts, that these past two years have been anything but easy, anything but predictable. I hope that we can predict one thing, that we can expect at least one thing of each other, which is that our love in this year to come will burn more brightly, our arms will extend more widely, and our acts of service to one another and the world will remain at the heart of who we are and why we are at UUCCI. As the late Reverend Dr. Dick Gilbert calls us, may we be keepers of thy flame. He writes, O flaming chalice, symbol of a free faith, burn with the holy oil of helpfulness and service, spread warmth and light and hope, warm hearts grown cold with indifference, light dark places with justice, rekindle hope in despair. May we bring fuel for thy fire of love. May the oil of loving kindness flow from us to thy leaping flame. May hands of service shelter thee that no winds of hate may extinguish thy brightness. May thy light and warmth be eternal. May we be keepers of thy flame. Friends, do not take lightly the living tradition that we hold now in our hearts and in our congregation. Do not take lightly the gift of being a part of a living tradition rather than a dying one. May we feel held by this tradition and committed to adding to it every day and in every way, wherever and however we are able to gather as a community. May it be so, from my sanctuary to yours, today and always. Amen. And now these words of benediction from Peter Rabel. We build on foundations we did not lay. We warm ourselves by fires we did not light. We sit in the shade of trees we did not plant. We drink from wells we did not dig. We profit from persons we did not know. We are ever bound in community. May it always be so. This is as it should be. Together we are more than any one person could be. Together we can build across the generations. Together we can renew our hope and faith in the life that is yet to unfold. Together we can heal the call to a ministry of care and justice. May we ever, may we ever be bound to such a community. May it always be so. Amen.